This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 21st. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GL chapter 30A, uh, section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemslick, and as chair of the Pl Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 uh, p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call. Board members, when you hear your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Uh, Maria Chow? Present. Tom Long? Present. Andrew McDowell? Present. Doug Marshall? Present. Janet McDowell? Present. And jo Johanna uh, Newman? Present. And myself? Um, it's good. Okay. So, board members, um, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let uh, Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are being addressed, and the minutes will note if a disconnection has occurred. Please use a raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call uh, upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom call teleconference link that is shown on this slide. There you go. And this link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website through the calendar uh, listing for this meeting or so you go to that or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on that most recent agenda, which also lists the Zoom link. So um, now you're front, if you're on the phone, um, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button. When public comment is solicited, if you have a Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment pressing star nine on your on your telephone, when called upon, please identify yourself by sending your full name and address, put yourself back into mute. When finished, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discussion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. That is that. So, um, the minutes, so we have minutes from, um, I'm just bringing this up. So we have minutes from ten seven. Ten seven, yes. That's and right. Ms. So, McGowan and, and then, and, and then uh, Janet McGowan had, you know, some minor comments on that. Uh, I, did everybody see those? Okay. Uh, no one has seen them. Um, I sent them to you, Jack, and you okayed them. And so now the board needs to see them. And um, oh, okay. And so, oh, oh, okay. So, Pam, you can you can throw that up there in terms of. I'm I'm gonna give it a try. Hold on. Okay. Here we go, I think. Right here. So it's page four. 
it's in red right here. And Jack, Janet has her hand raised. Okay, Janet. I know I was gonna just ask Christine to read that because I didn't have it written down. So that was it. And I could hardly see it actually. Would you like me to read it? Mr. Hartman clarified that the easement to the pond area would be written to provide vehicle access to the dam for maintenance only. It would not include public access, but he added no one would prevent people from walking up the driveway to use the pond. So anyone want to move to approve the minutes with that, that modification? Um, I'm sorry, I got to get the. Uh, Mr. McDougall has had his hand up. Okay. I'll make the motion. <laughs> okay, and a second. I'll second, this is Johanna. Great, okay. Uh, so we'll do roll call. Um, uh, Tom? Oh, excuse me, any discussion? None, okay. So, uh, Tom? I uh, agree, approve. And Johanna? Aye. And Doug? Aye. Andrew? Approve. Janet? Yes. And myself, I think that's everybody, right? Maria. Oh, Maria, I'm sorry. How did I miss Maria? Okay, I'm, I'm just going by this <laughs> panelist list. And somehow you slipped. I'm sorry. My apologies. Uh, no problem. So, I approve. All right. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, seven zero. And back to the agenda. So uh, we have the uh, public comment period. Do we have any any hands there? I am seeing no hands. Okay. Great. So I think we can get right into this uh, the public hearing for the site site plan review. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so I know, let me start bringing in some people. Okay. In the meantime, let me grab um, I'm just going to, I believe Celine is going to be the presenters. So I'm just not sure if she has other folks with her. I'm here. I don't see myself, but I'm here. And Martha Lyon is also joining in. Okay. I, okay. I see her. And Jane Wald is also joining. And yes. Okay. So um, are we ready to, to begin this? I can read the preamble. Are we good, Pam? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, so it's 641. Um, we had 635, so we're clear. Um, in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2021 05 Emily Dickinson Museum. 280 Main Street. Uh, they request a site plan review approval to install a permeable pedestrian pathway between the two historic homes, including lighting the pathway and to install site lighting to illuminate the facades of both homes and some tree removal. Uh, this is lot, uh, you know, map 14B parcels 26 and 27 in the RG zoning district. So are there any board member disclosures? 
none. And we can ask the applicant to present their, their project. Uh, Jane, do you want to say a few things uh, before Selena and I proceed with this, since you're the owner or the owner's representative? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about the goal of uh, a little bit about the Emily Dickinson Museum, uh, its interest in this project and its goals. Um, uh, and I'll begin with the path between the two houses. Um, there was a uh, a path between the homestead and the evergreens, both uh, Dickinson family homes in the 19th century, that um, was well-traveled between um, the poet's home and her family next door. And there is a bit of uh, kind of historical significance in Emily Dickinson's own words uh, that it, it was uh, the, uh, a path uh, for two who love. So this is a, a quotation of Emily Dickinson's that has kind of wide play. Um, we have historic uh, landscape photos that uh, show us the route of that path and um, indicate the kind of paving material for the path. Um, uh, we have a, so there is this kind of historic preservation restoration, landscape restoration piece to this. Um, there's also a practical goal for us and the path, and that's to create an accessible link between the two houses. At, at Right now, our public tours are tours of both houses. Um, there is no accessible route for, um, for wheelchairs or um, uh, or those with mobility uh, difficulties at, at present. So this would be, um, this would, this kind of improvement would allow uh, for all of our patrons to be able to access both houses and to experience the full tour. Um, the, uh, um, so that, I think that's a, a kind of a significant goal. Um, we have uh, programs that take place, tours and programs that take place after dusk. Um, so this is one, one reason for lighting the path. Um, as I understand it, we, uh, as a, a, as a in, in institution that welcomes the public, we are obliged to provide safe and accessible uh, uh, pathways and lighting for our, our patrons. Um, so for the lighting of the facades of the houses, um, our goal there is, um, is twofold. One is uh, to um, highlight uh, the historic features of these houses as a kind of a cultural asset of the Amherst community uh, and, to, and to take care of um, security needs at the same time. Um, so I think that's probably all I, I want to say at this time, and I'll be glad to contribute later if there are questions. Thank you, Jane. And I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, my firm has been involved in this project for a number of years, um, I think at least three, maybe more. And um, we have taken a lot of pains to try to get um, as accurate and an authentic, as authentic replication of the path as possible. Um, there was a question about the lighting um, designer and we did engage the services of a landscape lighting specialist um, who's worked on some other very historic, very significant historic properties uh, who spent uh, a couple of seasons trying to get this lighting just right. Um, I think he nailed the evergreens first uh, as a couple of years ago and then he came back this summer and did a lot of um, experimenting with the homestead. And um, I think that really came up with a solution that um, suited the needs of the homestead or the museum, as well as um, just uh, highlighting those properties. And 
I wanted to just also mention the, that um, I was involved with the Amherst Historical Commission almost two, year, two decades ago, writing the Amherst Historic Preservation Plan, which involved a significant historic engagement um, or public engagement process. And through that, um, this museum was identified as the single most important historic resource to the town of Amherst. And so I think the, um, uh, the museum's efforts to really increase its one curb appeal that was accomplished through restoring the fence and the hedge a number of years ago, and then just making these houses so much more visible uh, to the public um, is a really a way of fulfilling uh, what was identified in that plan. So um, Selena Weber is uh, working with me on this, and she's been very involved with the technical aspects of it, and she'll walk you through uh, the different features of the plan. And then also, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, so it's uh, Celine? Selena. Yeah. Selena? Selena OK. Um, like Martha said, I've been helping her on this project. Um, and uh, I met some of you this morning at the site visit. So there's three basic um, portions to this. Selena, we can, I, I can't really hear you. Yeah. Uh, uh, what can I do? Uh, I'll try to speak up. Is that any better? A little bit. A little. OK. <laughs> Maybe if I move closer. Um, there you go. I, uh, um, there's three major portions to this project. And I guess at this point, maybe Pamela, if you would allow me to share the screen so I can yep. walk you. Sh you should be able to do that, Selena. At the bottom of the screen, there Got should it. be a green icon that says share screen. Share screen and, all right, <laughs> So we'll start here. So the first project, um, the first part of the project is um, what Jane alluded to, uh, is the new path um, between the homestead. Can you see my um, my cursor here? Yes. Uh, between the homestead and the evergreens, and um, I actually have another drawing. This drawing shows. The current path is this dashed line. Um, and this, the, the proposed path, which meets more of the historical um, aspects, is this swooping curve. So I just made this drawing since this morning. So you can see that it deviates a little bit from the original, um, but not substantially. Um, and this path will be a permeable path with um, four feet of stone underneath it and a, uh, a drain that connects uh, to the, city, the town stormwater system. So the path is, as we discussed earlier, is accessible and um, won't get foggy like the current situation. Um, I'll show you just briefly. This is the grading plan. So there's an under drain in the path that connects here to the catch basin in the street. There's also a couple other under drains that are being connected to this system. But we're not changing any of the, um, the impermeable surfaces. It's still uh, the same amount. So the town engineer, I, I believe, is um, on board with this um, proposal. The next part of this project is just north of the path. So the, the current path is this dashed line right here. And currently, there's a little clearing with some trees. These trees are going to be removed, and this is also uh, trying to mimic the historical situation that was there during Emily Dickinson's time when this was uh, a clearing with a garden area. 
the hatched area here will be cleared of all saplings less than six inches in caliber. Um, these bigger trees will remain in place. Uh, the trees here that are being removed, the stumps will be ground and there will be restoration to restore the disturbance. And that's about 0.3 acres of area that's going to be um, affected. And then the next part of the project is the lighting. Um, and this with the help of the lighting designer, um, we've um, managed to uh, do a number of things. So the first thing is lighting the path between the homestead and the evergreens. So right now there are no lights there, but to increase the, um, uh, the safety of that path in the evening, there will be tree mounted lights that shine down onto the path to create a um, fairly even um, level of lighting across that path. There will also be lights pointing onto the house. So again, like Jane um, and Martha both mentioned, um, one of the goals of this project was to really highlight um, that these historic homes that are just such a, uh, an important part of Amherst's uh, history. And so these, these uh, facades of the two buildings are being lit, um, illuminated with these lights. And uh, the lighting designer worked uh, and tried different situations out. And, and so the, the design is uh, a result of some trial and error and, um, and design um, to achieve the best possible look. So there's a combination of lights. There, there are lights that are mounted on granite posts and the beam of the light, the uh, spread of the beam of the light is shown in this plan view here. The dotted line indicates uh, the width of that particular light fixture. So we went to great effort to make sure that we were shining the lights on the buildings and not spilling uh, light beyond the buildings or spilling toward neighbors uh, as well. So most of the, the lights are all pointing away from Main Street, mostly, um, and towards these So there, there are lights that are mounted on granite posts. There are lights that are mounted on the, in the trees to light second stories. There are lights that are mounted um, in the ground on stakes that wash the walls with light. Um, and then behind the home shed, there are also uh, lights that light this little pathway that leads from so there are a number of different lights um, going on. Oh, and then there are also lights lighting the two fence uh, gateways at the, the pedestrian entrances, at the homestead and at the Evergreens. And these are flush mounted lights um, projecting onto the fence posts. Um, there are also um, security lights on the back here in the garage pointing down and behind the evergreens also pointing down. And then the last part of this lighting situation is that the entry um, entries have pendant lights that are currently kind of bright. So those are gonna be toned down intensely. So I can flip through some of these um, uh, elevations so you can see how the lights are located and uh, 
um, adjusted so that the beams cover the sides of the house. And um, so this is the homestead, the east facade and the south facade. Uh, you can see these are the little posts and these are the wall washes, washing lights which are closer to the house. Currently, I hope you've all had a chance to drive by and see the lighting demonstration um, that's set up currently. So right now, most of these lights on the south facade and the east facade are in place. So um, you can get an idea of, I'm sorry, south facade and the west facade are currently uh, in place. So you can get an idea of um, what it's going to look like. Uh, similarly, for the evergreens, there are elevations that show that, again, we're aiming the lights um, onto the, the building itself. And um, also for the fence posts. So these recessed lights are directly in front of the sidewalk and pointed towards the architectural posts. So this is a, a the, the lights that we'll be using. These are the lights that are down lights. These are the path lights, these are the recessed lights. And then these are the lights that are being, um, are projecting onto the to buildings. Um, in case you haven't had a chance to go see, the illumination. This is a, the demonstration lighting for the evergreens, which is currently not um, set up, but this was done um, a couple years ago. Shows you what the lighting Will look like. And this is the lighting that's currently set up um, that you can see if you drive by after, after dusk. And this is an example of the path lighting, uh, although we're planning to have a more even wash of lighting um, along the pathway. Uh, that's kind of a summary of the situation. Um, I'm happy to delve into more detail or answer questions. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, to the board members, did everybody feel like they, they caught all that? I know, Selena, the volume wasn't, wasn't great. No, I think I'm, so I'm okay sorry. with it, but I just want to check. <laughs> I just want to check with the planning board if they didn't catch anything before we get into the site visit. Um, okay, we're good. All right, so we have a site visit report. Um, I have that, Jack. You want to give me a second? Yes. And, and uh, who would like to present? Whoops, finding that here, sorry. <laughs> um, so many documents. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Chris Bestrup, you, you produced that? I did, do you want me to go through it? Yeah, I guess, or unless one of the planning board members kind of want to uh, go over it uh, instead to probably be better. Um, well, we have Doug, it was there, Janet, and Tom, and Andy. So, anybody want to? Mr. Long has his hand raised. Okay, let's let's go with Tom. Give you a break. We're going to give you a break, Chris. So I have a question. Do we should we answer the questions as we go through this, or how do you how do you normally do this? 
Uh, there are no questions yet, but um, let's, well, just, let's just get through this part and then we'll have some questions for okay. you. Yeah. yeah. So Tom. Sure, I'll, I'll give a quick um, overview. Um, I think uh, Jack, what uh, I think it was Selena that was referring to the um, the site report that was posted actually has a series of questions in it. There were things that um, came up as part of our discussion on site, and I think it's just important that we reiterate them here um, so that uh, those answers uh, can be made publicly um, and others can hear. Um, but we were, um, we met on site today. Uh, we were able to um, have a conversation in conjunction with the, the plans. Um, so we were able to look at um, and imagine where the uh, historic path was, where the new path will be placed. Um, in relationship to that, there is an existing location on the site that has the same material that is intended to be used on this path. So we're actually able to see um, the actual material for the new proposed path as well. Um, we were able to uh, identify all of the trees that were to be removed um, in the grove that were discussed um, and seemed for the most part appropriate because some were um, um, damaged or um, dying in some places. Um, and we were able to take a look at where the existing um, mock-up lights are, um, what some of those fixtures might look like. Um, and most importantly, we were able to um, ask a lot of questions about how this will be implemented. And I think that's what, um, again, Selena was remarking down below that we had a pretty lengthy conversation. The visit was quite simple in terms of being able to stand at the site and see all of these elements, the two buildings, the path between where drainage might go and what that material was. Um, but I think it's important if we wanna go through these questions, maybe that's, that's useful unless um, someone has anything else they wanna point out that we may have encountered on the site. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions from the board? And looking for hands. Mr. McDougall has his hand yes. raised. Yeah. Well, do we want to just read through these questions? I mean, I'm happy to do that, Jack. But uh, on, on the screen on page two, we've got sort of a, a, a preset uh, list of questions we talked about this morning. And then I've got I've got some subsequent questions that I've come up with since the site visit as well. I think it would be a good idea to read through the questions and answer them as you go. Yeah, I'm, I, and okay. I'm, I'm happy to do that if, if, uh, if you want, Jack. Uh, That'd you. be great. Okay. Have at it. All right. Um, so has the town engineer agreed to connecting the new drain line to the existing catch basin in the road? To answer that, is Selena going to answer that? Um, Yes, I, 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 I believe I saw the email that he, he said that uh, he has no objections to it. Okay. Uh, will the lights along the pathway be mounted on the tree trunks or in the branches? So in the pathway, it will be mounted on the trunks. Um, the, a lot of those branches are up very high and they'll be somewhere between 20 and 35 feet up from the ground level. Okay. Actually, and I had a quick follow up to that one as well was so they will be since those trees are on the, the south side of the walkway, the, the, the trees that will remain, they will be pointing sort of north. Down. Yeah, there is at least one tree that's on the other side of the walkway, maybe two, two trees that are on the other side oh, of the walkway. Yeah, okay. They'll be pointing pretty much down. Okay. All right, um, thank you. Back to the, the others. Will the neighbors across the street be able to see the lights? So I, I don't think they will be because these lights have a long adjustable shroud on them and then they're pointing down. So they won't see the, the light itself um, from the fixture. Do you think for the ones on the north side of the path that are pointing south, would those be visible? 
I don't think so because the shroud is actually pretty long on these lights, so the actual bulb won't be visible. All right. Um, and we mentioned this already, but did the applicant work with the lighting designer on the design of the exterior lighting? We did work with one. Okay. Um, have a butters been notified? Yes. Um, and what is the purpose of lighting the pathway? So the pathway lighting uh, lighting is, well, the path was to connect the two houses and then the lighting is to um, just uh, increase safety and to reveal the, the path itself too, to, to show where that is. Um, when will the lights on the pathway be turned off? So the lights on the pathway, um, I imagine, will be um, much like the lights on the facade of the house. So they would go on at dusk and be turned off somewhere around 10 o'clock or so. All right, so all of the exterior lighting would be on the same schedule? Um, all of it except for the security lighting at the back side of the property by the garage and behind the evergreens. So that lighting will be on all night. Will there be electrical conduits going up the tree trunks? There will. They have to be powered somehow. <laughs> Not actually a conduit, though. It's a direct burial. It's a, it's a wire. It's, a, um, it's yeah. not a conduit. Right. Okay, yes, right. Hey, I guess, can you clarify that? So it, it, you'd have a... Mm -hmm. uh, how does that actually... So from underground to the tree, how does it go up the tree? Then? I don't understand that. It's a wire. Which is a wire that comes right out of the ground that's stapled to the tree up to the light? Correct. Okay. Um, all right. Will the electrical conduit lines be buried? Answer that. Um, or the wires will be buried. How will the lights that light up the facades be mounted? So uh, there's two different, well, no, there's three. Some of them are uh, mounted in the tree. Uh, some of them are mounted um, in a granite post, and I actually have a photograph I could share with you. And some of them are mounted on a uh, PVC stake, which will be you know, not visible, just the fixture itself. Um, how will the second story facade be lighted? Uh, those will be lighted with uh, the tree mounted um, lights in some of the trees. Right. Uh, how will the lights in front of the fence posts work and where will they be located? So they're going to be um, in front of, directly in front of the um, fence posts, uh, right next to the sidewalk. So as, as close to the sidewalk as we can get them, they're flush and the light will be pointed towards the fence posts. Um, what kind of exterior lighting was in place in the time of Emily Dickinson? So that's something that um, Jane knew more about. Um, do you want to say something, Jane? All right. Yes. Uh, what we know about uh, what we know specifically about uh, exterior lighting during Emily Dickinson's time is that there were gas lamps at the entrance to the to both houses. Uh, at the evergreens, there was um, a pole-mounted gla uh, gas lantern uh, during Emily Dickinson's lifetime. After her death in the 1880s, when electricity came in, uh, came, was wired through Amherst, uh, those fixtures, uh, lamp lights, were powered by electricity. Good. Um, when, so what time will the lights be turned off at night? So we were thinking somewhere around 10, 10 p.m. probably is what the museum is predicting. Is that correct, Jane? Uh, yes, that's correct. That, I think that would be, uh, that's the time we've been discussing and would probably be the earliest time we would want to turn them off. Okay. To tag on to that, is that seven days a week? Yes, seven days a week. Okay. Uh, will some of the lights be on all night? So just the security lights. Um, 
what is the slope of the proposed path and will it be flush with the grade of the lawn area? So the path will be flush. It is a gentle um, slope um, to make it accessible. And there is a cross slope to shed any water that also falls on it, uh, no more than a 2% pitch, cross pitch on the path. Okay. Uh, what color is the exterior lighting? So, you know, warm, cold, blue, yellow. Can you give us a sense of that? So the 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 photos kind of show what it is, um, and so Martha, do you want to speak to that since you helped with determine that? Yeah. So um, these are LED fixtures, and we um, we I guess color them down or warm them up to the warmest we can get, which is 2200 Kelvin. Um, the designer started with 2700. And um, I think, again, looking at the demo, the demo, um, we decided that it, we wanted to tone it down some. So we're going with as low, as low a, a light lower for an LG, LED that we can at, the, at this time. Okay. And because the houses are yellow and ochre, um, it, it casts a warm light. Okay. And it, it's going to be the same for both buildings? Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, um, uh, yeah, the, the effect is the same, but there are different bulbs that we're using on them. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Um, let's see. Will lights be on in the buildings when the exterior lights are on? So the plan currently is no, no lights on inside. Um, <clears throat> how will snow removal work on the new pathway? So snow is, um, Amherst College plows, uh, uses a uh, snowblower for the um, remote, is that right? It was a snowblower. Okay. Yes, that's yeah. correct. So um, it'll be um, snow blowed and this material um, has withstood that pretty well. Okay. And what, what's your assessment of the level of light? Is it uh, appropriate for the neighborhood? So um, the designer worked really hard to um, come up with lighting that would uh, reveal, you know, the, the architecture of the house in a, in a beautiful way and without Really destroying the neighborhood. That being said, of course, it's you know it's a subjective uh, opinion, but the idea was to um, uh, try to fit in while at the same time um, revealing this historic place. The last uh, formal question here: Can the designer provide information similar to a photometric plan to show the intensity of light that will be cast on the facades, and also that will be reflected back into the landscape? So, there was a photometric sheet that was part of this package that shows um, what the actual foot candles are at um, at uh, uh, distances from. Uh, from the house, so we could extrapolate. You know, we can look at those and give an idea of you know what the foot candles on the house are. That being said, I think it's uh, easier to understand by actually looking at the demo uh, and seeing pictures worth a thousand words. Um, so it's a quick way of. Uh, seeing what the what the plan is. That is all of the pre-written questions, Jack. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions from the board? Uh, Johanna? Maybe a question for Jane, but I was wondering if there are plans to restore the garden once the trees are out, since that was part of the kind of the site in Emily's day. Yes, um, yeah, uh, gardening was really 
very important to the family at the homestead and the family at the Evergreens. Um, so you may know that Emily Dickinson and her sister Lavinia had extensive gardens on the east side toward Triangle Street at the homestead. And our long-term plan there is um, to do uh, as much archeological investigation as we need to do to restore those gardens. Uh, documentation of gardens on the Evergreen side, which would be in this area between the two houses, is uh, more slender. Uh, but all indications are that there was there were gardens and perhaps chicken runs up on the slope uh, between the two houses. Um, and being able to uh, sort of clear up some of that area will um, enhance our ability to you know, do the, the archaeological investigation that may give us clues there. There are some, there are some features already up that slope that indicate there were gardens and there actually are um, in the spring you can see um, daffodils coming up uh, on that slope that were um, definitely planted in and maintained in the 19th century so there are some there's some interesting uh, clues there to what we might be able to do in the future thank you uh, Maria Uh, thanks. That was a really lovely, I'm sorry I couldn't make it to the site visit, but that was a really lovely presentation. Um, I personally am all for aesthetic lighting of architectural features. I think that especially since it's such an important um, <clears throat> centerpiece of the town that this, this um, lighting plan makes sense. Um, I have one question just like, you know, are, are the lights able to be on dimmers? I didn't look at each fixture, but that might be um, a way to test it as well if you know neighbors or butters or um, other issues come up that there's a way to dim them a little and also um, looking at your photometric chart uh, it, yeah it's very low foot candles when you get far away but I noticed it's pretty high foot candles when the lights are you know when it's a short distance and there's only a few lights where I can see that create some hot spots because they are closer to the building and I was wondering if the lighting designer did that for a reason, like um, I see mostly on like, what is that? The, is, if North is up, the east side of um, the homestead and the pictures in our, um, what do you call this? Uh, the, uh, the thing we get every week, the pictures we have seem very reasonable. They seem kind of dim. Um, I just see a few hot spots sort of on the building. And so I was wondering if you could answer, right. Uh, a, are, are they able to be on dimmers and B, um, was there a reason for some of the lights to be like closer to the face of the building? And it, it feels like there's a few sort of um, places where it's a little brighter rather than an even sort of dim glow to the house houses. Um, those are my two questions about lighting. Okay. So um, the first question about the lights being on a dimmer, these particular lights can't be on a dimmer. And uh, the designer did Selena, I would, uh, if you can get closer to your mic. Oh, sorry. Great. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lights cannot be on a dimmer, but the designer did work on, um, you know, he tried various different configurations to try to come up with something that um, was pleasant. Um, it could be that the, so you, you said some of, some of it was still right. So not every single light is in there currently. So um, the, the lights that are farther from the house are mocked up, but there are some lights that will go closer to the house um, to wash those walls. So once those are in place, I think it's gonna be more even effect and you won't get that glare that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I think, the idea of you know doing lighting on a building for aesthetics is a very nice idea but um but yeah i just i want to be wary that it's not spilling over into the butters or like creating night pollution but um of course uh andrew Jack. <coughs> 
Um, I was looking, it was actually useful to see your screen of L5 because it was a bit darker than the, the, the printout I have is just the lighting plan. Um, I just want to make sure I'm following it correctly. So it looks like there's a, a gap of light. Um, the light, put that on. Oh well, yeah, that would be great if you don't mind. It, it, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this correctly and I'm, I'm probably not, but. So this yeah, plan, so, the lighting plan? Yeah, right. So the, the dark cross hatching, that's like the cone of light essentially. Yes, so let's let's look at, this is, uh, we saw that one tulip tree where I said two lights would be put in there. And this is the cone of light from that light fixture. It will roughly illuminate that area. And Got it. one will illuminate that. Okay, so that helps. So that that's the tree lighting, that's not ground lighting. So then, um, all right, so there is going to be a, uh, a gap there. There is. It's yes. not for the whole path to be lit. It's, it's accent lighting. Right, so that, you know, you feel safe um, because you can see that there's light there, but it's not, you know, this bright situation. Perfect. And then the other, I guess, I'm, it, it's, um, yeah, maybe more a comment. I'll, I'll save it. I'll save it for later. Um, thanks, Jack. Thank you. Uh, so I have a dumb question. Uh, the light, the, the, um, the Evergreen and Homestead have operating hours till what five is that correct so about uh depending on the season till about 5 30 plus okay. um plus evening events from time to time okay evening okay so this is just kind of to meld in with the existing lighting on the buildings and highlight this path uh the, uh uh, the the path lighting is really more um, kind of intended, I think, to be more functional. So that um, the focus of that is really to provide safety for uh, individuals crossing between houses after dark. Okay, well, upon those occasional events, basically. Yes. Yeah. And, and okay. yes, and it, during, um, uh, you know, winter season when the days are shorter, it helps with our, uh, that last portion sure. of the, of the day where it's open to the public. Great. Thank you. Um, and then Janet. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I wasn't sure what plan that, um, the photometric plan that Maria was talking about with foot can candles, is that L5? Because I didn't have any. That's this one, I believe, right? Did we get this? Or am I? Mm -hmm. I guess we did get that, but I haven't. I haven't connected it to the chart. Okay. The second question I had was, I think during the site visit, um, someone said that the um, lights at the entry doors that are there now were thought to be too bright, and so they were the, the light levels were going to be reduced. And so I was wondering if that's, that would affect how Maria's rat, if that would lessen Maria's concern, if those were reduced in terms of intensity. I'm trying to find the drawing here. So you're the talking about were, here, this the one. The were the yes. front door, I think. I thought we were told that yes. they just seemed too bright and so they were gonna be brought down a little. They are going to be. Um, so then I, talking to Maria, I'm wondering if that would change her view of it, or actually you're looking at the post view. So I'm just gonna to defer to experts on that. Um, and then I also at the site visit, I thought that the path lights were gonna turn off when the museum wasn't open. It was just, it, you know, if the museum was open, you know, in the evening or late afternoon, they'd be on. And then when people, the museum was closed, they'd just be turned off. And I just wanted to know if that was the plan and to confirm that. I guess I'll defer to Jane about that. Uh, yes, that's that is our intention. Uh, that are you know that, that those are more functional, uh, and then the architectural lighting is more of a wash that is a presentation of the of the historic houses. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Maria. 
um, that last image, I think maybe the mock-up isn't representative of the L5 lighting plan. So I think as long as you, you're, yeah, um, see the, the right most drawing, how there's a hot spot right below that window and yep. it doesn't look like that's actually in the plan. So as long as, you know, you have a lighting designer who's very, you know, capable and making sure there's no spillage and it's all the, um, yeah, I'm sure it will be fine because you, you've got someone who's, you know, a, a designer who's actually, this is what they do for a living. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I wasn't actually talking about the entryways. It was more the ones that were creating a splash of hot light on the facade, but, um, but it doesn't look like this is like L5 is slightly different. So, um, so it, it's okay. I think, yeah, it, it should be fine. But when I spoke to him this afternoon, he said, you know, it's there may be a little bit of um, adjusting as he comes to install this because obviously he wants it to look terrific. He doesn't want to have the, um, the hot spots. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Andrew? Thanks, Jack. Um, uh, one one quick question, just on the the clearing of the trees on the north side of the property. You said basically anything uh, below a six inch caliper is going to be removed. I, I'm trying to remember: is there ground cover there, or will that end up being turfed? What's what will be the plan for that uh, that vegetation area um, that's beyond the trees that are going to be removed? So currently, there is um, there's low ground cover and. Um, growing there. So we're going to remove the saplings, but we're not going to remove all the ground cover. Okay, but six inch caliper is pretty big. So like there, there'll be, there'll essentially be the seven or eight trees there and then ground cover is the plan. Right, correct? but there are some big trees that will remain in that area where we're not clearing. So um, yeah, it looks like seven or eight or something like that. Okay. Thank you. And then the only other, and I guess maybe more of a comment, but just, or, or so anybody in the phone might have an answer for this. Are there any other similarly lit properties near downtown that, I mean, is this, is this matching a precedent? Is this setting a precedent? Is that something that we should be concerned about? So it's maybe more rhetorical, but I guess I, I just put it out there for consideration. Thanks, Jack. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know, maybe Chris, you, in terms of that perspective, can you want to speak to that? I think that the Grace Church has some night lighting, but I don't really remember the extent of it. I walk by there at night on my way to the car often, and I believe that they do have some lighting on the facade, but I can't really remember exactly what it is. It's also possible that the St. Bridget's Church has similar lighting, but again, I don't really remember specifically. And, oh, I know, and the um, Unitarian Church, I believe, also has some facade lighting. So those are three places that we could go at night and look and see what they're doing. Thank you. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I'm... Uh... I have some concern about the brightness that comes through on the photos that are on page L11. Um, and I guess I, I would like a chance to go by in an, on an evening and see, uh, see the mock-up in person. Um, the other thing I wanted to know was on the mock-up now, uh, what, what fraction of the final lights are are installed or are part of the mock-up as opposed to the final plan? Is it half of the lights or is it more or, or you know, just sort of roughly? Selena? Uh, I have to take a guess at that by looking at the <laughs> plan. Like and just, I know the lights um, on the east facade towards the back, the pathway, those path, the pathway lights are not on. I think um, I'm the, more uh, focused on the building, the building post, lighting. The, the post light, uh, post mounted lights are all there, I believe, Martha. So it's just the wall washing lights that are not in place. Mm -hmm. So it's more than half the lights on the west and south facades. 
Yeah, and also just to reiterate, the Evergreens dem uh, demonstration is not up. Understood. So it's just the it's just the homestead. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Oh, Tom. Yeah, I just had a quick question. We we raised um, a question in the early Q and A about whether the neighbors have been notified. Chris, has anybody responded um, negatively from those notifications? Neighbors have been notified. Um, no one has negatively responded, and I'm looking to see there really aren't any direct abutters in the, um, the list of attendees this evening. Okay. Um, some of the attendees may wish to make a comment, but they're not direct abutters as far as I know. Okay. Thank may you. I, may I make a comment about that? Uh, and I think Martha will, uh, and Selena will probably have better information about this than I, but the demo has been there for two or three months, three months. Um, so I think it was June. It's June, okay. I think it was June. Very good. Uh, Janet? You know, I must be not circulating because I've never seen the Emily Dickinson lit up at night, but it, um, I have a quick question going back to what Doug was asking about. I think Selena said something about the wash lights aren't as part of the demo. And what is what is a wash light? Is it one of the little um, the little mushroom lights that are along the side, or what is what does that mean when you say the wash lights aren't on? I will show you. <laughs> Let me get out of this. Bear with me a moment when I find the right one. So. Um, if we look at the, this is the homestead, and here's Main Street, here's the front of the homestead. These are the demo lights on this little um, post that are in place currently. They're not on a granite post right now, but they're they're placed um, okay. right here. These spoked wheel looking things, it's just the symbol for the light that we used here. These are the wall washing lights and really what that means is they're up closer to the wall and they um, shine um, you know up the wall more so it, it's it's in this situation it looks the same but um, it's it's a more steep angle if you look at this drawing here you can see this angle is more steep against this wall because the light is so close to the wall Whereas these post mounted lights are, um, you know, more broad. So, so when we look at the demo, we're not going to see the effect of the closer lights because it's not there, right? It's not there. Huh. Okay. But that's, that's just going to enhance what's there. So these, you know, will create some kind of a, a, a bit of a maybe spotlighty effect, but then these wall wash lights is my understanding will kind of blend all of that in. Does that sound right, Martha? <laughs> it does. I think that um, what the lighting designer was trying to accomplish here, these are very difficult buildings to light um, because they have so many angles to them, especially the evergreens. But Homestead is even, um, even difficult. And I think Selena, you were absolutely right, you know, that he's he's got the lights that are further away that are going to be broader on the building, but um, but then with, with just those, you would end up with some dead spots. And so he's introducing some lights that are closer to the building to kind of even everything out. And that was, I think, the objective um, of was what the museum was trying to achieve. So if, if I was looking at the building tonight outside, these kind of darker spots would be brighter. And then I could hopefully look at the chart and figure, make the jump from there. Okay, so I do see what you mean by dead spots when I'm looking at the picture. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he's really, he worked really hard to try to remove those and it was, yeah, it took a lot of effort. Um, Actually, these do a pretty good job already though of making it pretty even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Uh, Doug, I see your hand raised. Yeah, one thing uh, that we had some conversation about this morning was uh, uh, the dark the dark sky uh, regulations or standards that that are sort of uh, used in the industry. Um, it sounds like the board doesn't really have a policy of always requiring that, but certainly some of these lights are shining uh, up in a, in a way that you wouldn't normally do if you were just doing general site lighting. Um, so I wondered maybe Chris, could you give uh, us all a review of what historically the board's attitude has been about dark sky? The board has generally uh, required dark sky compliance. Um, I think what that generally means is that they don't want lights shining up into the sky. Um, lights that have a shield around them, what they usually say is dark sky compliant and or shielded. So um, if a light has a shield around it and it keeps the bulb from being seen, you know, if you were a bird or an airplane or something flying over the building, um, and the shield was such that you wouldn't be able to see the bulb, but the light projected onto, you know, the surface, but it was contained within that surface. I think that would still meet the spirit of the, of what the planning board generally um, tries to achieve. And I did send you some material from the city of Somerville, and they have um, something in the, in the second, I think it's the second page of that, document that um, has some exceptions. So they say essentially that they want um, dark sky compliance except for certain exceptions where lights can be shielded and directed towards a particular surface and don't um, spill out into um, other areas or other properties. I forget exactly how they put that, but um, I thought that might be helpful to you and thinking about this, because I, th I think that the main thing is that we don't want the lights shining up into the sky, but if they shine on a surface and aren't spilling um, beyond that surface, then that could be um, considered to be approvable, satisfactory, appropriate. So um, most of the lights are shining either down to the ground to eliminate the path or are shining up onto the surfaces of the buildings. Um, though, I, I, am I right that there's two locations along the sidewalk at the pedestrian entries, uh, one to the homestead and one to the evergreens where there are lights that are basically just shining straight up and some of the light goes onto the fence post and, and probably much of the light is just going up and away. Is that true? Uh, so that is the correct location. They are very adjustable. So it's a 30 degree angle on them. And um, so uh, what would appear to be, um, so if you were up above, the light isn't shining up. It's the way I was understanding it, that it can be adjusted so that the light, in this case, the bulb is part of the fixture. So the bulb is adjusted to shine in its 30 degree angle which whichever way you adjust it to be. So the so the fence post lighting is also aimed at the surface of the fence post. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. That's shown in a cross section L9. Yeah, I could share that. So here you can see the recessed light and it has the ability to be adjusted. Um, it's a 30 degree beam, but you can, you know, you can point it wherever you need to point it. And we're gonna try to move this, we're, we're because the sidewalk is so close, you know, we only have so much space to work, but we're gonna put the light as close to the sidewalk as we can to get that um, angle to be the way it is. <laughs> Here it's shown in plan. Great, Mar uh, Maria. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of answer what 
Doug was asking, we generally do ask that all lights are dark sky compliant, like when there's like a commercial project or a residential, if it's in a, doing something strange in a new zone, we don't, but this is a very special different case. It's kind of like what um, Chris had sent out. It's like a monument or a statue, you know, it's something that's very much a, a feature. So I, yeah, I don't think that the dark sky light fixture needs to apply, but the dark sky idea definitely does where your lighting designer will make sure it's not spilling out onto um, creating more night pollution and not spilling onto adjacent properties. And so I think it's been pretty clearly made that the planning board generally always feels that way. But in this scenario, I think as long as the um, spirit of the um, uh, dark sky compliance is met, the actual fixtures themselves, you know, they're, they're not pointed the way we normally require them to for um, projects that we review, but this is a, uh, like that Somerville um, bylaw, it's it's a, uh, a different case. It's like a, yeah, it's a, a feature or a monument. So um, I feel like, you know, you guys are doing your due diligence with um, a line designer and making sure that <clears throat> there won't be any kind of um, uh, dark sky non-compliance, I guess. So, um, but yeah, generally, Doug, we do always look for that specific feature for light fixtures, the dark sky compliance. Thank you. And Tom. Hi, uh, sorry to beleaguer this a little bit more. Chris, you sent around the site plan review notated 1124. Is that an Amherst related site plan review document? Because um, there are conflicts to discuss potentially there in that 112417 notes that um, all lighting shall be kept extinguished outside of business hours um, or, you know, established under the site management plan. So I guess I'm, you know, wondering if we actually need to make an a, a amendment to that or make a, a notation um, in regard to that. The way I look at 11.24 is that those are guidelines of things that the planning board needs to look at when they're evaluating a site plan review application. Okay. There may be extenuating circumstances having to do with one or more of those um, criteria that you would find a way of, um, of uh, how can I say this, mitigating the effect. Um, yep. And then you would explain in your um, findings how you felt that that effect was being mitigated. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. I don't believe we have any other uh, board comments and we can open this up to uh, the public. And Pam, do you see anything? At this point, I see none. Okay. Uh, so the applicant has, I think, has responded. Oh, you know. Dorothy Pam just raised her hand. Okay. Let's have Dorothy speak. Okie doke. Um. Dorothy. Uh, I just there. want to speak positively about uh, this plan. Um, uh, however you make whatever minor ad adaptations you might make, because I think it just makes for a nicer town that if you're driving by, that you see some of the beautiful historical architectural pieces and houses um, light lighted up, not like a carnival, but kind of, this is like um, sedate um, lighting. Um, so I just wanna say, I think it's a great idea and I'm positive about it. Thank you. Uh, Chris? I just wanted to note that the um, local historic district commission will be looking at this on Monday. So um, I don't know if you wanted to make your decision uh, sooner than that, or if you wanted to wait and be able to have all the planning board members um, both be able to drive by and, and see the buildings um, in their demo, um, with their demo lighting, and also hear from the local historic district commission. 
So you you might consider um, continuing this public hearing to November 4th so that you can accomplish those two things. Makes sense to me. Um, I don't know if any of the other board members, um, you know, agree with that, but Doug? Uh, well, yeah, I, I would agree with that. You know, I, I, I uh, you know, it's clearly they've, that the museum has gone to a lot of effort. They've engaged a sensitive designer and they've put, um, you know, the documents are great, um, but I'd, I'd still like to just be able to either drive by or stand and look at it uh, with an eye toward, you know, thinking of it as a mock-up and uh, before we vote. Okay. Uh, Janet? I agree with Doug. I'd like to be able to see it. I'd be very, um, just look at the mock-up and also I'll look around downtown and look at other buildings. I think there's lighting on the um, Boltwood Inn and maybe um, some other buildings. So it, it's nothing really jumps out in my memory, but I'm happy to um, look at that. I also am very interested in what the Historic Commission has to say because it addresses a lot of the standards that we look at. Um, I'm a little worried about the sentence that um, I can't remember who is Tom point or Andrew pointed out um, in 11.2417 when when the bylaw says shell it's not really guidelines or guidance it's it's kind of a more of a command and so I'm wondering I'd like to ponder that line more because it looks like it could have an effect on how we look at things so so that, all to say is I'd love to postpone this or continue our hearing until the next um, our next date or after the historic commission meets. Thank you, uh, Johanna. I am inclined that way too, but I was curious whether there was any kind of urgency on the part of the applicant, or whether you know us pushing back to November. Like, does that create any hardship for you all? Good question. Um, I, I would say that I, you know, ideally we would like to uh, implement this project, you know, before the ground freezes. Uh, but we also have, we are also obliged to um, have this plan reviewed by the State Historical Commission. Um, so that may, uh, um, we will not have an answer from the Historical Commission before November 4th. Andrew? Well, you're muted. Thank you. Thanks, there Jack. You, um, you may have already answered this, Jane, but um, I, I was I was just thinking that alternatively we could approve the, the grading in the path and wait on the lighting if that, you know, if we feel like that would be, that would allow you to get your, your earthworks done before freezing, but it sounds like we're probably if we if we continue in two weeks, that's still probably consistent with the timeline that you just out, uh, laid out. So um, it seems to me like it would be prudent to wait for the two weeks. Okay. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I uh, it, it really is the you know the below ground work that the state historical commission is going to be concerned with. So I I, um, I think we can wait the two weeks. Thank you. So should we have a motion to uh, continue with hearing? To I will I will so move till November 4th at what time, Christine? Um, you have another public hearing that night, but that one is not until eight o'clock. So I think you could continue this one to um, 635. Till 635. Okay. Second. All right, Doug seconds that. Uh, roll call, uh, Andrew. Aye. I'm sorry, there, there, there might be discussion, I'm sorry, but no discussion. All right, good. All right, uh, Andrew. Aye. Affirmative, uh, Doug. Aye. Uh, Janet. Yes. And Johanna. Aye. 
Maria. Yes. And myself, yes. So that's seven zero. Mr. Long oh, needs oh, to. Gosh, I, I look at this list and I'm like, oh my God. All right. I had to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So there's seven zero. All right. No, I apologize. No. My apologies. Okay, so we can move on to the next next item. We we thank you, uh, thank you. Jane, Martha. Good uh, luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. And sorry. Um, all right, so. Um, so we have old business Applebrook cluster subdivision, um, SUB 2007-00006, currently known as Hartwell Farms cluster subdivision, request the lease of lot seven. And I believe that uh, requires us to bring uh, Tom Reedy on. Hi, Tom. On, hey. Hey, Jack. Hi, hey, everybody. Reedy. Hello. Nice you. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hop right into it. Uh, so I was here, oh boy, a, a few months ago, and, and we had talked about releasing lot four. We had originally suggested it be switched to lot two. Um, and then I think Janet had suggested, well, why, why not make it lot seven? And we said, sure, because lot seven wasn't going to get built upon for quite some time. So circumstances have changed a little bit. And uh, the developer is looking to sell lot seven. So instead of build upon it, he's just he's going to sell it. And then it's going to be built upon separately. It's going to be built upon by the same builder that's been doing all the other um, houses in the neighborhood. but. He's just not going to wait for it all to be done before he sells it. So obviously that accelerates some things. Um, we've got a we've got a date of October 30th for all the road work to be done. Everything that Jason had on that list, and if you're familiar with it, I think Jason's total was like fifty-eight thousand uh, dollars. The majority, the great majority of which was road work. Um, we've got or the client has Warner Brothers coming to do that. Um, on the 30th, um, the closing is scheduled for November 9th, of course. Um, so we would be here asking for a release of lot seven, and I guess there's probably a, a hierarchy of how we would suggest it happen. Um, my first and preferred would, would be just to release it, understanding that we have Warner coming in to do the work this year. Um, if the, the board's not comfortable doing that, then I guess we would say vote to release it subject to us providing you, you know, whether it's a written contract or written evidence of them to do the work ahead of the ninth so that you feel comfortable. And then the third, which is, I don't prefer to do it because it's gonna cost more money to record a new document, but would be to switch it from lot seven to lot two. The last one seems, I mean, I can understand if you'd wanted to do it, I just, I think um, probably that middle option, you know, the porridge is just right there in the middle um, with the release subject to providing evidence of that work to be done by, by Warner Brothers. So that's why I'm, that's why you get to see my mug again is because um, I'm asking for that release. So uh, Pam, can we throw anything up with regard to this? So to give some of the planning board much. members that some perspective I apologize that we didn't prepare anything for this. Maybe Tom no. has a plan that he Yeah, can... I can I can see how creative I can get with sharing my screen. Okay. There we go. Nice. Can you see the screen with the yeah. ANR. Okay. So this is the latest ANR. Um, Route 116 is on the lower part of the screen. You come in, Vista Terrace is here. 
you've got lot eight, which is built upon lot one, which was an existing structure. Um, lot two is not built upon yet. Right next to it is open space. They've just been kind of stockpiling soil there. I think lot six, if you drive by, that's the one that's currently being constructed. Uh, lot five, I think, has a house on it. Lot four, I believe, has a house on it. And lot three has a house on it. So lot seven is the one tucked away here, um, does not have a house on it, but it's under agreement to close land only um, on November 9th. So I don't know that I have the, the list handy from, from what Jason had put together, um, but, but his estimate, you know, the majority was the surface course of $11,000, hut mix asphalt berm of about $12,000, and then the hut mix asphalt walk surface of $18,000. And this was provided to Warner, and Warner would be doing all of that, all of that work. Good. Um, Doug? Yeah, I guess there's, I, I, I thought Tom was going to say another option, which was, can we release the release lot seven contingent upon the work in Warner Brothers list being completed? And since it sounds like it's supposed to be completed by October 31st, in which, you know, I, I, I don't really care whether there's a contract to complete it. I, I'm more interested in whether it's completed. So it would seem like we could do that and maybe arrange for Jason. If, if Chris is open to this, have Jason agree to go out there on November 1st and then we all know that it's completed and our contingent release takes effect and they can close on the 9th. Or, you know, we're supposed to meet again on November 4th. So if we have to talk about it again, we could do that. Can you can you meet just a point of order? Can you meet on the fourth if it's an election day? It's the third. That's the election day. Is it? Well, look what I know. That's what COVID <laughs> ballots are. I guess <laughs> every day is an election day. Um, well, I mean, if that if you're gonna if you're gonna be meeting on the fourth, then I'm I'm fine with that. I was just I don't know, Doug, if they're gonna be able to start on the thirtieth and finish. My guess is probably not finish on the thirtieth. So I just wanted to give you something where you saw like. Okay, this this is going to happen. It is moving along, and you felt comfortable. But if if you want to check in again on the fourth, and you're meeting then, then I'm I have zero problem with that. Thanks, Doug. That's good comments, uh, Janet. So I, I went by Applebrook today, and there was an excavator on lot seven. So it seems like I was wondering if there's urgency to. Tr are you trying to close on the? Was it the seventh or the ninth? Because the ninth. Then okay. So then the builder is is he is he going already or um, kind of like how lot six had a house on it when we were supposed to. Have it <laughs> no, no, no. Like, I don't think it'll be as dramatic as that. Um, like a, a lot of digging equipment there. And yeah, and I don't frankly I don't know if it's just. I mean, the reality is and. As the board, I can appreciate if you would take offense to putting a cart before the horse, especially what, with what happened with lot four, which I think was more of an aberration and oversight than anything else. If anything, having, and this will be the lawyer in me, the, the excavator on the site shows you that they know they're gonna do that road work because then they're definitely gonna want that lot released. And if they're gonna start spending money to, to start digging a hole, then they're, they know what they're going to do it. They know what they have to do. It's, I don't want to get mired down in the kind of technicalities of it all. Um, but I think when you look at it, it's, it's something they had been planning on the whole time. It's just in the nature of when this stuff is happening. Yeah. And maybe they're putting it on lot seven so they don't have to drive it over once um, the pavement happens, the paving occurs. Yeah, they were. It looked like they were moving dirt from lot seven to lot two, but I wasn't there that long. But I, I think I think Doug's idea is a good one, and you know, I, I don't have a lack of trust or anything, but I just feel like let's do things in a sequence that protects the interests of people. So, the people we're supposed to be protecting. So, Chris. So I just wanted to understand what's um, being proposed here. Um, 
is Tom, Mr. Reedy, proposing that the board wait until November 4th to um, vote on whether to release lot seven or not? So I guess what I would ask is, I'm just thinking of how to expedite it because if they get it done on the 30th and the and the first, let's say, then I wouldn't need to come back here on the fourth to have any release because they would have done the work. So I think that would be preferred. And then let's say if for some reason they don't or it's mid construction, I'm happy to come back in on the fourth to, to discuss. Chris. I would rather have the board um, trade lot seven for lot two. I'm very um, leery given the uh, problems we've had with Amherst Hills and when we agreed to certain things and they didn't happen and that's a lingering thorn in our sides. And so I, I really feel like the best solution as far as the, the planning department and the planning board goes is to um, release lot seven in exchange for lot two at this point. And then at least you have something and um, that would be my recommendation to the board. And, and you could make that um, decision tonight and then whatever happens on November 30th or November or October 30th or November 9th, we don't have to worry about it because you've got lot two. But then I, then I'm, we're spending money to, I mean, and it's $105, but it's still $105. Not to, a big deal. To record. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, compared to, I guess the alternative, Chris, would be just don't take action tonight then, right? And just so then nothing's changed. You still have lot seven. If anything, you'll have more leverage come November 4th. And then if we, then you'll either see that there's progress happening. Jason will say, yeah, everything's done. Or the board may still get cold feet and say, we want lot two. But at least if, if you're going to go with lot two, I'd say push that decision off. Mm -hmm. That would satisfy me and my recommendation. <laughs> okay. Andrew. I was, I was actually just going to mention what Tom did. I, it's, it seems like, um, let's just meet on the fourth. If it's done, it's done. If it's not, we can talk about trading lots. Okay. Well, that was simple. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so um, do I hear a motion to move this to, uh, was it November 4th, and take this up again? I don't think you need to, to take a vote. I mean, you okay. can if you want, but I don't think you need to. Hey, less <laughs> votes, less votes. The, well, no, in general, we all want to vote. <laughs> okay, but in this case, uh, I agree. Let's not vote if you don't think it's necessary. So let's move on. Okay. Tom, are you good with that? I don't know what's next on your agenda, but I know I've got maybe two other items on here. The the A and R. I don't know if that's going to come up um, for Cortland Drive. And then 40 hour discussion. And I don't I don't want to impose myself on on the board, but I didn't know where those were coming up in the agenda. Do we have a 40 hour? The A and R is um is on the agenda. I don't think we put the 40 R on the agenda yet okay. because I hadn't talked to Jack about that and decided on a particular day or night to do that. Yeah, I think that was gonna be like report of the chair. We we're hoping to I want to discuss with the board uh, some conversations I've had with with Chris and and others, and then I'm most certainly would hope that you would be able to present uh, something, you know, as you discuss. But we haven't even broached that. Um, but we have to kind of like revitalize that discussion because uh, we did have just you know the forum last week. Um, it was, you know, I think Maria and I, you know, viewed it, maybe some other, you know, I think Janet might have been there, but maybe some other uh, board members saw that, but it, and it, it, it invigorated my, my interest in, in the proposal in terms of the 40R, you know, downtown. And uh, so 
we're not there yet. Okay. But I, I'm I, happy really, to... I, I, I really appreciate your, your proposal to present something just from a, you know, a third party kind of perspective, because we need sure. that. Because we, so, we don't, this would be Amherst's first 40R. We don't know, uh, we're not familiar with it. Uh, you know, downtown is very sensitive uh, with regard to, it's everybody's downtown. And, um, but I appreciate that. I kind of wanted to talk about that sure. with the board members later in, in the program. So great. Uh, but we could talk about the A&R if you wanted to just move that up ahead a little bit, Jack. So sure, that absolutely. That would be great. Thank you. And Pam has a map um, showing the A&R. I do. Bear with me. Let me just give you some background. Um, this ANR came before the planning board sometime in the beginning of the summer. And um, we got a note back from the town engineer, Jason Skeels, that um, he wanted to see a sewer easement across one lot. <clears throat> it, it, it's really, um, I think it's one big lot that was divided into two, or there was a change in or something like that. But anyway, um, Jason wants to make sure that the new lot that is not built upon yet um, would have the um, sewer easement across it to serve the existing house. And and Pam, can you go back one step to the um, focus map? You just had it. Whoops. Up. Hold on. It's on Cortland Drive, and it's oh. at the end of Cortland Drive. Sorry, I lost the whole thing. Bear with me. And anyway, when it came before the planning board, and um, there it is, and Jason Skills said he wanted to have this sewer easement. So the planning board said, well, that's fine. We will authorize the chair, who at that time was Christine Gray Mullen, to sign the ANR plan. But then um, the new plan showing the sewer easement was never given to us. So here is the, um, here's the configuration of the lots as they are now, the yellow one with the house on it and the turquoise one um, that hasn't been built on yet. And then Pam, can you show the a &R plan? Yes. So the a &R plan is a little bit different. You can see that the lot line between the two lots has been um, changed slightly and um, the purple strip down close to the road where that circle is, that purple strip is proposed to be the sewer easement. So Mr. Reedy is asking you to um, agree that Mr. Jemsek can sign this plan um, as, as an ANR for this property now that it has the sewer easement on it. And we can do that this week if the planning board authorizes Mr. Jemsek to sign it. So. Does anyone have any concerns? Uh, I see Janet's hand. Could, could we go back to the previous map, the, um, the kind of the more general one? Mm -hmm. That one, yeah. So this is not, a, this isn't really a question, maybe a little mega. So this, this road was put in, and this isn't a subdivision here? It is. It is a subdivision. OK, so, it's a, so the road has been put in. It's a subdivision, and somebody's dividing their existing lot, which looks quite large, to create another lot. Is that I right? I think two lots exist now. Correct. So, so Chris is correct. The, the, the two lots do exist. Um, I think they were, they're in common ownership. Uh, I think the house might've been built at a time potentially prior to that, the building circle requirement. Uh -huh. um, and so what they've done is they've now changed the lot lines to make sure that both lots have the requisite amount of frontage and can fit the building circle. In okay. Them. Okay. So that, okay. That helps me understand frame or understand how we got to looking at this. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So do you want to go back to the a &R plan now, Pam? I will. 
So here's the plan, and, and usually the board um, agrees by consensus that the chair can sign an A&R plan if there aren't any um, issues about it. And since we already looked at this plan back a few months ago, we had the building commissioner look at it, and the only requirement was that they come back with um, the sewer easement shown on the plan as requested by the town engineer. It seems that um, it has everything that it needs to have to be um, to be authorized to be signed by the chair. Um, any any discussion? Further discussion amongst the board? I see no hand. Oh, Doug. Mr. Marshall. Yeah, I was going to uh, offer you a motion to, to close the discussion and go ahead and vote or do our consensus, whatever, however we get to consensus. Yeah, Chris, uh, is this, is this since a vote? It's, since it's remote, a vote is probably a good thing. Okay. So I will make sure. All right, Tom, since I skipped you before, you are first. Um, Approved. <laughs> we need a second, Mr. Oh, a second. Sorry. Tom seconded. Tom, second. would you like to second? Okay. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, Tom, regarding approval of this or approved. recommendation of this. Approved. Okay. And Maria? Yes. Johanna? Yes. Doug? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. Did I miss anybody besides myself? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, so. Okay, thank you. Seven zero, all right. Thanks very much. Thanks for taking it out of order, too. Okay. Thank you. Okay, have a great night. See everybody later. All right. Night. Um, so old business topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours uh, prior to the meeting. No topics. None from Chris. Okay. And moving <laughs> on to new business, uh, we have um, wanted to just, you know, respect Marion, Marion uh, Adams, and uh, she was at so many of our planning board hearings and kind of passed away, you know, too soon, uh, unexpectedly. And we would like to pay um, our respects to her. And I'm just, um, Here we go. I wrote up a little something that I'd like to say. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my folders here. Oh, here we go. Oh, sorry. All right. So I'm just, um, we distributed, you know, the, her obituary, which was in the paper, but um, because uh, she was, you know, compassionate, you know, toward, you know, the, you know, town uh, development. Uh, she, always, she always was respectful. She was at a lot of our meetings, uh, presented herself well, was, was uh, always had the, the decorum of, of any, anyone that you would, you know, ask that came, you know, in front of the planning board. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Chris. Um, she, uh, Marianne passed away on October 6th and it was quite, um, she had been ill for a while, but it was still a surprise. Um, she had been a longtime activist in Amherst and um, she followed activities of the planning board really closely, particularly with regard to zoning amendments. She was a town meeting member 
and she paid a very close attention to the business of the town. Um, she attended zoning subcommittee meetings regularly for several years and offered her perspective as a longtime resident. And she was someone who really cared about neighborhoods, especially those near the university. She was very protective of those neighborhoods and was actively involved in establishing the local historic district the local historic district, and then became uh, an active member of the local historic district commission. Often, Morian did not agree with projects or zoning amendments that were being proposed, but she had a gentle collegial way of making her opinions known and sharing her perspective. Um, she saw herself as a bridge between town government and people who didn't have time or the inclination to be so involved, but were concerned about what was going on. Um, she and I had many lively exchanges over the years, and I had a great affection and respect for Morianne. And I'll miss her. Excuse me. Mm. Sorry, I couldn't help that. Yeah. Especially seeing a picture. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we can have a like a moment here just of remembrance for her. So uh, her family has has requested that you know donations be made to the Fisher Home, uh, Hospice of the Fisher Home, or uh, Dakin you know, Humane Society, Amherst Survival Center, and Amherst uh, Community Land Trust, or a nonprofit of your choice. So uh, anybody that that watches this, uh, please be aware of that. And again, we we appreciate what. Uh, Marianne has has brought in terms of her 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 thoughts, well intentioned thoughts in front of the planning board. And again, her she always the most polite person, and uh, should be sorely missed. Looks like you have two people who might want to speak. Jack. Okay, let me see that. Uh, uh, Janet. Thank you. Um, I think I might have met Morianne Adams in a zoning subcommittee meeting or planning, watching the planning board meetings when I used to attend. And um, I mean, you know, she, so much of her life was dedicated to bringing other people into the conversation. That was her work at the University about multicultural participation. She's written books. Um, you know, she came to the zoning subcommittee, which um, when it was going, always had lots of community members too. And she was a, you know, she was so eloquent. I think that's like, it's hard. I mean, her voice was so resonant and she had a great way of putting her ideas forward in a way that I think people had a good chance of listening to or were able to listen to. And I know that, um, I mean, I think the best way to remember her is to honor her commitment to her neighborhood and that people, you know, in the downtown, you know, we all care about the downtown. She lived next to it. Um, you know, we care about the businesses in the downtown, the, the small shop owners that are struggling now. Um, and I think, you know, as we talk about the downtown, let's bring those people, make sure those people are being heard, that the people in the neighborhoods that really care so passionately about the community, that they are part of our process and we bring them in. And so that is my real reason to be on the planning board is to make sure that the people most affected by the decisions that we make are part of the conversation. And so. I wish I was as eloquent as Marianne and as graceful and articulate, but um, she's she became a very good friend of mine and a person I really look to for help. So I just, um, it is hard to look at that picture. It is hard. So I wanna thank her and just, I think we should honor her by keeping and talking with our community and making sure everybody's part, of, everybody's at the table. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Dorothy. Can you bring her in, Pam? I can, I think. What's going on? Whoops. Oh, no. Now I've got trouble. It's okay. You, you just bring Dorothy Pam in. I. Chuck, I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I, you. 
<laughs> All right. Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I certainly would like to pay tribute to Maureen, and I'm so glad that Bob and I had a little surprise visit on her porch. I, I think it was just two weeks before she died, in which she talked about the planning board and what was happening in town, and. Um, uh, she is the first person who spoke to me about town council and persuaded me to run, um, which was something I had never intended to do. She was always positive and hopeful and strong in her belief um, in Amherst's historical neighborhoods and in the strength of our town. Um, one of the things we discovered after we'd known each other for a while is that we'd both gone to Swarthmore College, she a little bit before me. And um, in many ways, she exemplified some of the, the Quaker ways, which are gentleness and respect, but speaking truth to power. So I do want to honor a very strong woman tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. That, that's, I mean, she was just, she was just out of a form as of, you know, a few weeks ago. So it's just, it really is shocking, but. Yeah. Uh, we will miss her. Okay, I'm, I'm moving on to next on, on our agenda. Okay, sorry. Um, all right, so we have Article 14 amended, which is the temporary zoning uh, introdu introduction and discussion it can be provided by Chris Brestrup. Yep. And it looks like we have a hearing scheduled for our next meeting on November 4th. Um, so this Article 14 was passed in the early part of the summer um, as an effort to uh, help the restaurants and the other businesses in town to get back on their feet after being closed for a couple of months. And um, it really was an effort to, it was to allow the building commissioner to make administrative approvals of certain types of uses. And it was really limited to restaurants and retail stores and um, I can't remember what they all were. I have it in my packet here somewhere. But anyway, um, what um, has uh, transpired since, back then we thought, well, maybe this would only be um, a short-term thing, this COVID-19, and that it would be all done with by the end of the year. And um, so we could then go on our merry way. But it's it turns out that it's actually going to be with us for much longer. So. Um, the building commissioner and I were asked to look at Article 19, Article 14 and think about how we could extend it into the future and also if we had any ideas for um, improving it. So certainly extending it is, is the easy part. Um, the governor has, um, has an order, governor's order, I think it's number 35, but anyway, he, um, he got on the bandwagon shortly after the building commissioner and the town of Amherst did, and he allowed um, existing restaurants to be open and to operate um, on the sidewalk or in the street or wherever they could possibly manage to operate um, until I think it was November 1st. So the governor has since extended his order to um, expire 60 days after the COVID-19 emergency expires. And we don't know when that is gonna be, but we wanted to have something in place that um, went to at least December 31st of 2021. Um, we're envisioning that COVID-19 is gonna be with us through the summer and through the fall of next year, probably. And we want restaurants to still be able to operate the way they're operating now. Um, so what I'm coming to you tonight with is, and I think I've sent you information about this, and maybe Pam could pull up the Article 14 on the screen, that would help. Um, I just wanted to introduce this topic to you and, and make sure that you were ready for um, the public hearing that is gonna be coming along on 
November 4th. It's going to be a joint public hearing um, between the planning board and the CRC, the Community Resources Committee of the um, Town Council. And um, you had it there a minute ago, Pam. There it is. There yeah. it is. So um, as you can see, this is our version of the extension. That is the planning uh, planning director and the building commissioner. This is what we're um, suggesting. Um, it hasn't been discussed by uh, CRC as far as I know, um, and they may discuss it on Tuesday. They have a meeting on October 27th. Um, but anyway, what we're, we're the current proposal is to increase the number of uses that are um, allowed to be um, to come under this this ruling, um, and we're adding medical uses because you know medical uses may people may need to have um, vaccinations or tests or something outside. We we're envisioning that some of the medical facilities in town, like Kate Atkinson's office and um, Valley Medical and the um, the medical facility on University Drive, that they may at some point have to um, offer services outside, not just within their building. Um, and those uh, facilities are located in the Office Park and PRP, Professional Research Park Zoning Districts. And so that's why we're adding the, those two zoning districts to our list of um, in the second paragraph here, OP and PRP. And then we've also had the experience, as you well know, that We've had to um, have some entities who, who just want to put up a tent, uh, like at the high school. They wanted to put up a tent to have what they called breakout space or additional instructional space um, outside of the building. So they had to come to the planning board for a site plan review, which was a you know lengthy process and and it um, you know cost staff time and to cost them time and um, so to sort of not have to do that. Um, perhaps not not to have to ask um, the survival center to come in um, for their temporary shed that they wanted to put up. Um, and there may be other types of uses like class one farm stand, class two farm stand, um, all of these things that are listed down below. Um, we're envisioning that those uh, types of uses may wish to have some sort of um, temporary use that would include a shed or a tent or something like that. And we've um, given a definition of what a temporary use is. So for your consideration, we wanted you to know about this and be prepared for the discussion that's going to occur on November 4th with the CRC. And uh, I wanted to know if anybody has any questions about this now um, and what you might think of it. Thank you, Chris. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Um, I was just curious, the temporary structure, the idea of a temporary structure, what, how that would actually be defined, right? Because you could have something that's enclosed and very small, which probably wouldn't help with, you know, mitigating any transmission, or you can have like the open tent like the high school has. So I'm just wondering if that is, um, if the, if if we've got the intent right on that, or if that's um, needs to be tweaked a little bit. So the temporary structure would be things like tents, like the tent at the library that's going up. The framework of that is up, but it also includes um, the shed at the survival center, which is a temporary structure. It doesn't have any foundation, and it's going to be placed on the parking lot. Um, and that's going to be going away when they no longer need it. And and you had given them some limited limited amount of time to have it there. I think you actually said if it was there for more than eighteen months that that you would expect it to go away unless they came back and gave you a reason to to keep it there. So um, instead of the planning board having to deal with that and go through that process and come up with conditions, the building commissioner is proposing that he would take care of these temporary uses and temporary structures via this um, expansion of Article 14. And it would be for a limited amount of time. It would be until the end of um, next year. Of course, you know, if he said that something could remain in place for 18 months, then that would be allowed. Um, 
just as you did, you said that the shed could remain in place for 18 months. So does that, does that, and, and that makes, that makes sense. I was just uh, more like the three that we've looked at the high school, the library and the uh, survival center, you know, one, the doors were always going to be open. One, the sides were not going to be on and one didn't have any sides. So I'm just more to the extent of like the, the purpose is, if the purpose is to provide more areas for people to congregate in a safe area that, you know, that it, it would, it would have some sort of acknowledgement of the fact that you need open circulation, but I, yeah, spirit, I, I'm totally on board with this. Uh, just mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I, um, first of all, Chris, thanks for explaining some of the changes. I hadn't really understood a couple of them. Um, I did, I, I do want to say uh, I'm uh, associated with the First Congregational Church where the Not Bread Alone Soup Kitchen happens. And uh, I think there's been some con conversation in that organization about how they're going to get through the winter and whether they need a, t a tent or a shed. And at the moment, the way I read this, I think they would need to come through the, to the planning board because they're not a they're not an educational institution and they're not a library or museum. So uh, I, I'm just wondering whether you might want to tweak this at least to save us one item on a future agenda. I don't, I don't know where that conversation is going to go, but um, I think that's a possibility. So actually this section 3.330.0 the way the building commissioner has written it is a nonprofit educational institution, but it's really nonprofit educational and religious institution. So we should um, we should clarify that. And thank you for bringing that up because it does include churches. Okay, thanks. Great comment, Doug. And uh... I should also say I think uh, Craig's doors might be another one that. Uh, you know, I know they're talking, I saw in the paper about them potentially moving from the Baptist church to the UU mm -hmm. church, but they may want to be doing something outside too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Doug. And uh, Chris, I trust you will make that edit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Janet? So I've seen um, medical facilities in the Boston area that do have testing had tents, outdoor tents in the parking lot for tent, for testing or whatever they're providing to their um, their um, patients. So I, I have seen that, and I could see that as a a need. Um, I also see that COVID could be going on for a long time, and so. Um, it may not be next summer, it might not be next winter. We might be dealing with a recurrent virus that we have to revaccinate for or we're not able to. And so um, I wanna bring back a concern that I had when we passed this the first time or voted on it, which is um, all these tents and all these structures that are going out are gonna have impacts on the people around them. And that could include people who are residents, um, people who are renters and apartments that could be the business next door. And I want to, I want to see some way that they can, they are consulted. And so, you know, often when we have um, someone put in an application, we have to notify the abutters within 300 feet. And that really means the property owners, but 300 feet from a business could include an entire office building with businesses that are having trouble, their customers are having trouble coming in or noise is too loud or, I don't know. I mean, and so I, I wish we would add something that would give notification to businesses, also give notification to businesses and residents within 300 feet. It could just be a leaflet at the door saying, this person has applied for this permit to build a tent. And we want to make sure that, you know, you know about this and can talk to the building inspector and, and Christine Breastrip about their concerns. There's right now we have no way of hearing of notifying people that could be directly impacted and um, they will, you know, they may not know until something happens. And after that, they may not know who to talk to. There's, we don't have a town hall with an open door right now. And so I just think, I know we're, uh, you know, I think our community is stronger if we it, have people notify what's going on, give them a chance to be heard and um, have their voice in there. 
And so I don't think it would slow the process down so far, partly because I think there's not going to be a run for outdoor tents in January. But I do think I want to see a provision in here that people, and especially businesses, are notified. And they may be a little hesitant to come forward to a hearing in front of the planning board and say something, but they might be a lot easier to talk to Rob Moore and Chris saying, you know, I love the restaurant next door. My, my clients can't get in, you know, or people can't go by because they're in a wheelchair and they're struggling or the noise is too loud for me to hear what my clients are saying to me. So I just think we have to have something that lets the public or the people most affected know. So I wonder if you can draft a provision for that or think of some way that's not administratively complex, but actually just gives people notification about what's about to happen next door to them. We can, th we can certainly consider that. Thank you. Hey, uh, Janet, um, the 300 foot perimeter, where's that come from? Um, is, isn't it the normal thing when someone files a, a permit application for a site plan review or special permit that abutters get notified within 300 feet? Chris, yeah. can you help me on that? Property owners within 300 yeah. feet. Notified so that. it's property owners, but when you're talking about downtown or a village center, there's lots of businesses there that would never get notified. Or, you know, somebody who's in an apartment building next door, the resident, the, the renters wouldn't be notified, just the property owner. It'd be up to the property owner to decide whether he or she wanted to tell them. So I'm just wondering, is there a way just to notify the people who are actually in that kind of circle? We will think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it seems a little bit, um onerous on on the types of things that this bylaw amendment is addressed to but i uh, we can discuss for sure um uh, johanna um it's funny this i I feel like we're still in an emergency and mostly it's like, let's just keep our businesses and our community afloat and working through this crisis. I can't help but think about, you know, at some point we're gonna emerge out of this. And I presume that there will be a list of all these structures that are out there and there will be a plan to kind of decommission them. Um, but that, I don't know, maybe, maybe we don't need to even think about that right now because we just haven't crossed that bridge. But, um, and, I, and I do see that there are kind of, you know, there will be a kind of application, so there'll be a process, so we'll know all the different structures that have gone up under this bylaw. So I think I maybe just needed to talk it out so that, you know, we didn't end up, um, I don't know, I'm like thinking about the FEMA trailers, right, that kind of like were dispatched and then they persisted even though ideally they were just temporary. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanna make sure we don't end up with a situation like that where, I don't know, we just have kind of like ramshackle structures scattered all over town in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think uh, my concerns are- You want uh, FEMA? What? What, what do you mentioned? Is the it FEMA? FEMA? You, you remember after Hurricane Katrina, they basically oh, okay. brought in the FEMA trailers and then they were supposed to be around for, you know, just like stopgap and then they weren't stopgap. Okay. No, not, not in Amherst. That's not yeah. in Amherst. New okay. Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Chris, please. So we are keeping track of all of the um, entities that get these permits and, and we did write a memo. I wrote a memo with the building commissioner to the town manager listing all of the. Um, entities that have received either Article 14 approval, or there were only three of them, or there were like 12 that had received um, approval under the governor's order. Uh, yes, this this memo here, and I think you had a copy of that in your packet. So um, we are certainly keeping track of these, and um, I think your point about making them go away when they're not needed anymore is, is certainly appropriate. So that is something that we're keeping in mind. And, and that's something that we could bring up at next, what is it, November 4th's um, public hearing with the CRC. Mm -hmm. um, who's next here? Andrew. Thanks, Jack. <clears throat> I was just gonna say, I agree with Janet. I, I, I like what she said, and I, 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 I would echo her sentiments uh, on the 4th as well.
Oh, yes, so, Chris. I will say that for the downtown, um, the bid has been doing a fantastic job of working with the um, business owners, the property owners, um, the restaurateurs, et cetera, about you know what their plans are for their property or their outdoor dining and what the adjacent um, company or property owners' plans are. So the bid is sort of coordinating it all in the downtown now, um, and that's it's not it's not codified, um, but it is happening. So just wanted to mention that. So Chris, uh, this is just the an introduction introduction to the this, and then we're going to talk about it next meeting. Yeah, and I would. We um, don't need to really take any action at this point. No, just read through the material that we've sent you. I think we're going okay. to be revising this memo to add more information about why we're doing this. Um, so you'll get more information as time gets closer to November fourth. And I think okay. Janet wanted to say something. And, and I see Janet's hand up. Um, just very quickly, I just wanted to say, I actually, I think that the, all the outdoor dining has been sort of exciting and interesting to see. And, you know, and, you know, I mean, it's just great to see people out and about. And it just, it's something we should maybe think about in the future um, about expanding more. And I actually love the picnic tables in front of town hall and i think we should have more of those i think I, I often see people sitting there like getting takeout food and sitting down and talking and stuff like that and so i know we have this big plan for that part of the common but it's an expensive plan and i thought you know maybe we can learn some things from the COVID situation about like you know what makes our town more vital or more fun or more interesting and you know obviously there's a, a lot of people who are happy to sit you know on some you know fairly rudimentary picnic benches and hang out and hang, hang out with each other. So I, I just wanted to say, I kind of see the benefits of this terrible situation that we're in. And maybe we can th think about that in terms of our planning. Good, uh, good comment. Thank you, Janet. May I say one more thing? About yes, that Chris. Um, I appreciate Janet's comments and I wanted to just let you know that the um, money that we're receiving from the Mass DOT grant we received about $130,000 for that. So we are buying more picnic tables and we are gonna put more picnic tables out on the North Common. We've also um, managed to distribute, I think 12 heaters to the local restaurants and we're hoping to get more heaters so they'll be able to carry on their outdoor dining um, farther into the season. So when you go down downtown this weekend, you'll probably see that um, some of the restaurants now have of heaters and there are other things that we're going to be helping them out with. So we're finally starting to see the um, the benefit of having gotten that grant. Thank you, Chris. I see no other uh, hands. And so um, we can move on to topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. No topics. Chris, you have nothing? Okay. Very good. Uh, form A and R, A and R subdivision applications, please. Um, we just talked about one with Tom Reedy, and that was the only one that we had to bring before you. Great. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications? No, I talked with um, Maureen Pollock, our planner, who is the liaison to um zba and she had nothing new to report she anticipates some things coming but there was nothing to report to the board tonight thank you uh upcoming spp spr suv applications we have not received anything new um there are always things waiting out there in the wings but nothing new has come in <laughs> Thank you. Uh, going on to the planning board committee and liaison reports, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, we did have a like a quarterly meeting, uh, and lots of you know topics were discussed. My gosh, uh, 
I don't have them like right in front of me, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, we, you know, we did discuss about um, the. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not even going to get into it because I, I don't have those nuts in front. Of me. I think the things that have been uh, preceded this uh, have kind of taken me off track here, but. Um, I'll I'm going I'm to defer this, you know, report to the uh, regarding the Pine Arbor Valley Planning Commission to the next meeting. So, um, yeah, there, there's just there's just so many factors, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then uh, the committee uh, community preservation act committee. Thanks, Jack. Um, we have our first, so um, I, I did get my official appointment, so I am a nice. member of that committee. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so we've got the uh, the list of um, projects under consideration. There's 12 of them. Um, they can fall under four different groups. There's six for historic preservation, six for recreation, I'm sorry, three for recreation, three for community housing. Uh, we meet for the first time tomorrow and we'll, I believe, have five weeks of meetings scheduled. Um, so um, I don't have much update aside from that other than um, we're getting started and uh, it looks like it's going to be fun. Thank you so much for taking that on. Happy to. And, uh, the Ag Commission, what's going on there? Doug is nominated, but I don't think he's been um, okay. Painted yet. The same for the the DRB with Tom. Tom has actually been appointed, but I don't know if he's received his paperwork yet. Okay. No official paperwork, but um, within the next few days. So. Good. Good. Um, and then the zoning subcommittee is on hold. Uh, but um, so report to the chair. So we have, I have a, a, you know, a few items here. Um, one would be Amherst Hills. We, we want to stay on top of that. And I've had some correspondences with, with uh, Chris Brestrup on that. And, you know, I, I encourage Chris to stay on top of the communications because my understanding was that that the the roads would be you know completed that the, the, there's areas of uh, deterioration there that needed to be replaced with, with regard to this uh, the the base um, course of the of the pavement and and then just final paving. So that's a lot of stuff. And, and now I think we have word that the DPW is 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 hesitant about whether they're going to want to do the plowing this winter. And so here we are kind of going into like um, uh, deja vu with <laughs> from a year ago. So that's why we're staying on top of it. And Chris, what 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 are your thoughts on this? Well, um, there seems to be a problem with um, Tofino having enough money to do the work that is um, needing to be done. Um, there's a an ongoing public hearing uh, in before the Conservation Commission that was continued from last winter to the spring in order to get a handle on vernal pools, but then um, information wasn't coming forth. They finally got the information, I think sometime in September, uh, the CONCOM, but then um, determined that the information they received wasn't, how should I say it, um, wasn't what they were expecting, I guess. So they've hired a third party reviewer to review the vernal pool and the wetlands issues on certain lots. I think there are six or seven lots that are in dispute. And um, so now they've continued the public hearing till sometime in April. 
um, when their third party reviewer will actually be able to go out in the field and determine what the limits of the vernal pool are and map them. Um, so that's all to say that I think Tofino was counting on the money that they could get from sale of some of those lots to pay for um, work on the road. I know Tofino did do some work last year in order to um, fill potholes and raise catch basins that were sinking and um, and do some you know kind of um, preliminary work to getting the roads up to snuff. Um, but there were uh, there was one whole section of the roadway that is um, considered to be subpar and needs to be completely taken up and the base course replaced and new base course put down and um, and then eventually paved. So, so Tofino is waiting to get money from these lots, aren't able to pave. So it's all kind of, um, as, as Jack said, it's like a deja vu, deja vu all over again. Yeah. Um, at this point, just to make sure that everybody knows what's going on, I don't know if I gave a full accounting of the history of this project, but um, Amherst Hills is a subdivision that was started back in the 1990s, I believe, and then um, the original developer uh, had financial problems and eventually sold to Doug Cole, um, and Doug Cole made a great start on, on this project, but then Doug Cole passed away, and then we went into the um, recession of 2008, so there have been a series of kind of mishaps along the way. Um, having to do with this development. So there are many beautiful, large, expensive homes built in Amherst Hills, but the roadway is deteriorating. And the planning board um, was asked to step in, and the planning board did make a decision, I believe it was in the fall of 2019, to ask the building commissioner not to um, issue building permits on I think it were it was six, six or seven lots, um, and so that request was formalized. Um, the the planning board took a vote. Um, we sent that letter off to the building commissioner, and then we recorded that um, that notice with the <clears throat> deeds. So um, those lots cannot receive uh, building permits until. Um, the planning board is satisfied that the developer is doing the right thing as far as the roadway goes. So the planning board does have that leverage. And according to our town council, that leverage is appropriate at this time. Um, I haven't heard anything from the neighbors recently uh, complaining about the road. Um, I did hear from the town engineer that he had had a meeting with Tofino. Tofino is the developer for those of you who don't um, know this project very well, but Tofino and Cole Construction are the um, developers of this property. Um, so Jason Skeels went out on the 21st of September and walked through the development with Tofino Associates and Warner Brothers, which is a paving company, and um, they were discussing what work needed to be done. Um, they have a punch list for the, the items that need to be taken care of, but um, they discussed late October, early November as potential dates for doing this work, but um, the town engineer said he hasn't heard anything since then. So I sent an email to Tofino's uh, attorney today asking him what's going on and, and telling him that the DPW is um, concerned about the road and um, concerned about its condition and concerned about whether they can plow it this winter. So hopefully we'll get some some response back from that. Yeah, I mean the the planning board should be aware that you know we had dozens of residents within the Amherst Hills at our planning board meetings when this came before us a year ago, and um, I mean it's it's complicated, but. Um, you know, we we are we. I'd rather us stay on top of this versus having them come uh, again. And 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 the the whole thing is it's complicated. 
So, uh, but I bring that up because we we do want that neighborhood to be, you know, accessible, and that requires the roads be paved and the town, you know, being able to plow the roads there. It, does anyone know? Have any questions about that? Or, you know with regard to where Amherst Hills is or anything, any any general questions, a little bit of catch up for, for the new members. Um, where is it? It's off Station Road. It's just before you get to Wildflower? Bethlehem on Station Road. Um, yeah. Past Wildflower. Keep going on Station Road, past, past it's the last, Roads, past last. Portland, and um, you're almost in Belchertown by the time you get there. Yeah. Part of Amherst Hills subdivision is in in uh, Belchertown. I think it's wow. Hawthorne, Hawthorne Street, and there's another street. I can't think of. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember, but yeah. I think if people Hawthorne. want to look at it, it's kind of it. It does need some serious work. Mm hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that that's. What's the ideal course of action the ideal course of action would have been that this subdivision was built and finished and it was that it was all done in a timely manner but in this case it's taken more than 20 years for all these various reasons that i've described and um and that is unfortunate and as a result of the length of time it's taken the base course of the road has deteriorated the town had a policy, and I think they're kind of getting away from that policy, but the DPW has long had a policy where they don't want the top course of a roadway to be put down if there are going to be new houses built, because then you have heavy equipment traveling over the new top course, and the town will be expected to take the road eventually and own the road and have to maintain the road. And um, they want the road to be built solidly. But in this case, the base course has been without a top course for ages. And so it's really, you know, wearing down. And um, that's that's the issue here. So Jason Skeels, who's the town engineer and the DPW uh, superintendent have relented in this case and said, you know, look, even though not all the houses are built there, we are willing to have the top course put down, but if we're gonna take over the road, we want it to be built properly. So. They're saying sections of the roadway have to actually be rebuilt entirely. And I think that's you know more expensive than what the um, developer had originally planned, of course. So it's it's um it's a difficult situation. There's also a lawsuit. Um, the developer has sued the residents, and I'm not exactly sure what all the ins and outs of that. Um, so it it is a complicated situation. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like limiting permitting on the residents there is also like harming them on or giving them undue harm based on choices of the developer or issues of the developer, which is also problematic for the people who live in those houses and want to make some changes. Well, the, the, um, the notice that the planning board put in the registry only relates to these six or seven lots that are unbuilt. It doesn't relate to the other homes that are there existing. Okay. Um, however, this lawsuit that the developer has put on the um, residents, I understand is keeping many of them from being able to sell their homes, but that's something that the planning board doesn't have anything to do with. So that's, that's a messy legal process that has to be carried out. Um, so we're not privy to all the information about this you know so personally i learned so much about like pavement uh with regard to uh what jason skills presented there is like there's a cliff like pavement exists and then it just fails and it's like a it's a it's a it's a it's a um you know it's a, a, drop sudden event, a sudden event. A sudden event. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, oh, okay. So it's like, oh, all right. Uh, 
you know, and, and, and that's, you know, a little bit of uh, pavement 101 that I learned from this whole process because uh, they had this temporary, you know, pavement in there, you know, wasn't, didn't have the, the top course in there. Um, but when it goes, it goes, I guess, is what, you know, we learned. And that's uh, where they, you know, they did significant patching uh, last year at this time and the town was able to plow, you know, during uh, the winter. And now here we are again, but we were, the agreement is that they would, they would have uh, finished the roads. So that's where we're trying to stay on, you know, on top of this. So uh, another, another item, um, the, and it probably can put this on the agenda. I don't want to talk about this. Uh, you know, because it's nine o'clock. Um, but the master plan implementation uh, kind of review, I think Doug was working with Chris on this some, um, and I don't know if you have anything to report, but we can start getting this on the agenda at some point. Um, we have a meeting set up for Friday. Friday, okay, good, good. Through the uh, items, and I think Doug said, He's going to hold my feet to the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. And then the other, the, the, the last item I have for the report of the chair, and I can't believe I have so many items on the report of the chair, uh, giving I whiffed on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, report, but uh, I am, um, I want to present to the board consideration of the 40R um proposal for downtown and there was a forum uh last week i believe and and i would like to get a discussion going within the planning board about the merits of the 40r you know district proposal in downtown um i feel i feel that there, there are merits to it that weren't apparent to me or pro, perhaps to most of the other planning board when it was presented to us in March of this year. And then, you know, there was a December one and then ones before that. But um, for, for me, and I think, you know, Maria was, was observed it, I think, you know, Janet as well, but it struck me as something that we need to look at seriously uh, with regard to you know what's best for the town. So I want to put this out to us, put it on the agenda. Um, we have the uh, the Amherst. Um, oh, geez, I got to get this. <laughs> Chris, all right. Housing Trust. Yeah, Just Amherst. Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Amherst Municipal Housing Affordable Trust. All right, whatever. But uh, <laughs> what an acronym uh, they came up with. But we, we, so what I'm thinking, and if you, if, if the board is, is, you know, copacetic with this, that we have, uh, Rob Crowner, who is a former planning board member, and John Hornick uh, join us and present their thoughts and perhaps even CRC. Um, and that we have sort of a joint, you know, meeting on this particular topic because so many things have happened with COVID, um, knowing that you know, zoning changes aren't going to happen, you know, you know, easily virtue by the zoning bylaws that would take a lot of time, but we have a lot of, uh, the, the, the downtown is everybody's downtown sort of thing. So I know that there's a butters, uh, but our downtown, it's the only downtown we have. I think we need to heavily invest in this discussion um, you know, we can talk about East Amherst or 
you know, Pomeroy Village, but I don't, I don't really want to, you know, kick the can down the road. I think from what I gathered from this last presentation, which was solid compared to the one that we received in March, that we consider this and give it, give it our, our review. So, um, Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add to that before we open it up to the board. Um, so I think that the last presentation we had, which as Jack said, was um, just recently, I think it was the 24th of, uh, no, couldn't have been 24th of October. It was the 14th of October. That's what it was. Um, anyway, it was much better and tighter and had been um, revised and improved. And um, I think it is worth examining and we're not we wouldn't take the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel, but we can discuss what has been presented to us and decide what parts of it do we like and what parts of it would we like to move forward with. And I think it, those of you who weren't able to attend that, that public forum um, may wish to um, watch the video and um, read up online. I think it's on the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust's website that the video uh, is posted and other information about. Hey, Chris, I suggest like Pam send that link out to all of us because that might be hard to find, but. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah, so I, I, I for, for me, it's like, it's, it was, it's the presentation from in March, I think the majority of the planning board is like, yeah, uh, let's look at, you know, East Amherst or Palmer Village, but, you know, it was almost discredited before we looked at this last presentation last week, for me, struck home, like, wow, this is something that probably would be really good, especially now that we're looking at the, you know, the age of COVID and our downtown is everybody's downtown. And so uh, I would like to bring this up front and center uh, to the planning board that we may recommend something to the CRC uh, and then, you know, town council. Um, Doug? Yeah, I came, I came late to the presentation on the 14th, but I did get a chance to look at all the slides um, it seemed like the primary change was that they uh, reduced the height that was allowed along Triangle Street, which seemed to uh, remove most of the uh, Cottage Street objection. Uh, but I didn't see very much else that had changed, and I haven't seen anything, any new draft uh, uh, bylaw. Uh, which, you know, I kind of agreed with Maria back in the fall, in the summer that it didn't look like it was fully baked. So I guess, uh, you know, from my point of view, I don't really think anything's changed since the fairly extensive conversation we had back in the summer. Um, so uh, have the politics changed or something else? Um, I'm just puzzled. Okay, um, I guess, you know, Again, the presentation, I, I, I think it was very on point. And so I, I, if you have not seen the presentation that the, the, from last week, you did? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, okay. you know, I mean, it, it, we're not buying the presentation, we're buying the bylaw. And, yeah. uh, you know, we haven't really seen that change at all. Um, so I, again, I, I just, I thought we had a long conversation about that this summer and people were kind of tepid. Um, you know, I mean, the massing that they had proposed both in the summer and now I think is an improvement, you know, is, is fine. Um, you know, I think the primary objection I had in, back in the, in the spring and summer was potentially down zoning, the, the base zoning in downtown. And I, I still would object to that. Um, so, 
um, you know, I, maybe you don't want to get into this tonight and I should just stop talking. So uh, I won't <laughs> no. say anything else, but I, but I just, I don't understand what's changed, I guess is all I'm saying. I, I feel like the, the, they, the, the presentation, they addressed a lot of the points and concerns and, you know, the flexibility there was, um, they just, they, they spoke to the concerns of, you know, I'm not an architect, but um, having, you know, fewer stories, you know, close to the street and, you know, a little bit of a build up back. It was, I, I thought it was, I thought it was creative, but also I guess I just feel like, we're, you know, this town has a housing crisis and downtown has a business crisis right now. And so I feel like this needs to come back in front of us and we need to discuss this because it's that important uh, to the town. Uh, Janet? I, I agree that we need to talk about the 40R. Um, I do feel much like Doug feels, and I think it would be premature to talk about it until we see the final report of the consultants. And I'm not sure if it's just going to be a summary of things, because in a way, you know, there was more, you know, there was less information on parking than I it seemed more. And you know, so I, I would like to see the final report. And I'm I don't know if the final report is going to be a revision of that bylaw, which I thought had some very significant problems. And so I I'd like to see the final document and work from there. That would make more sense to me. Because I to me it wasn't that much different other than pulling something off the map. It seemed like a lot of the problems remained. But I do think we should talk about it. But I would like to talk about a final product and not, you know, but I'm not 100% sure what that product would be. Maybe Christine has a better sense. Is, are they going to rewrite the bylaw and fix the problems or tighten it up? Or I don't, I don't know, I understand. They are planning to rewrite the text of the bylaw. Um, they did change the setbacks, setbacks from the street. They also changed side setbacks. Um, and they did, as Doug said, change the height. They also changed the um, the zones or the subdistricts or whatever they call them. Um, so now they only have two subdistricts. One is the um, yeah that I that I saw uh, yeah more extensively d dense denser development, and the other one is um, a residential subdistrict that only has three stories and has more has uh, greater setbacks. So they did um, respond in that way, and and my feeling is that. Um, we don't have to buy the whole ball of wax. We can choose to say this area right here, this area on Kellogg Ave is where we want to focus, or this area between Halleck Street and Coles Lane is where we want to focus, or the area north of Triangle, heaven forbid, is where we want to focus. So we don't have to take the whole um, the whole thing. And we can make it our own. We can take the text that they have written and say, well, we really don't feel like 15 feet setback is enough. We feel like 20 foot would be better. Or the side setback, we really don't like the 10 foot setback. We think that 15 feet is better. So it's it's something that we can take and make it our own. We don't have to take it as it's handed to us. This is a, a framework, a model of what could be, and then we take it and do what we want with it. That's that's my feeling about it. So I, I, would, I think we should talk about you're, I can't hear you. I say, I turn, my, I, I'd like to talk about it after we see the final product, because when you're doing a zoning change like that, the devils are really in the details. And my preference would be not to do 40R, but directly address the problems in downtown on setbacks and height and fix the underlying zoning. I think our time would be better spent there. And that's kind of what we said to CRC. But I, I, it's hard to talk about this. You know, I, I'd like to see this 28-page zoning bylaw that we, you know, proposal. And to me, it just doesn't make sense to add that to our bylaw just for small pieces around town. So, but let's talk about that separately when we see, when we get the whole thing in. May I say one thing here? Sure. Yes. My daughter's birthday is today and I haven't had a chance to celebrate it with her. So I wonder if we can um, talk about the 40R district another night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're just broaching broaching this this subject here. So, 
Uh, the other, did we talk about the master plan? We already talked about that. Okay. Master plan. So, okay, so we're, we're good. So report of staff. I don't have any report except that, um, well, no, I don't have any report tonight, but thank Perfect. you. Very much. <laughs> okay. So we can indeed adjourn. Uh, thank you all and in November 4th. November 4th. Meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Thank you, Chris. Take care. Bye. Happy Bye. birthday to your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.